Hello, welcome to the 42nd in a series of free webinars for peer supporters presented by INAPS, the National Association of Peer Supporters. We've been doing these webinars for several years and starting with webinar number 11, the recorded webinars are all available on our website. Today's topic is the history and philosophy of medical ethics for the peer support specialist. I'm Martha Barbone. I am currently the Interim Director of Operations for INAPS, and I'll be your presenter today. As always, the opinions expressed in the webinars are those of the presenters and not necessarily reflect those of INAPS. If you wish to get a certificate of attendance for this webinar, that is available only to members of INAPS. Um, you, you can send an email to me at membership at inaops.org to request a link for the quiz to the webinar. And after you take the quiz, I will send you a certificate of attendance. Today's webinar is one contact hour. Peer support specialists often need to make complex decisions that affect those they support, their employers, and their colleagues. Peer support specialists must consider practice standards when making choices and also must act ethically to respect the autonomy of the individual. This webinar provides some history of medical ethics, philosophical tools, and some ethical guidelines that can support peer support specialists in their daily decisions. This webinar is not about specific ethics for the peer support role. It is merely background of where medical ethics come from and hopefully will help you when you're in the field trying to make choices. The objectives for today's webinar are to recognize key events in the history of medical ethics. I hope you can discuss some of the ethical schools of thought. We will describe six ethical principles and we'll at the end discuss some elements of ethical decision making and recognize potential ethical minefields in peer support. The recorded history of medical ethics spans from approximately 400 BCE to the modern day. Some ideas have passed through centuries unchanged. Some ideas were tested and rejected or were transformed. This slide shows a bust of Hippocrates and a quote of Hippocrates is, it is more important to know the person who has the condition than it is to know the condition the person has. Hippocrates was a Greek physician who lived 460 to 370 BCE. His main ideas were that physicians were there to help and not to harm. And he spoke of two principles. The first, beneficent, beneficence, which is to help others, and non-maleficence, to avoid harming others. Hippocrates' te teachings are the origin of the Hippocratic Oath for physicians today. Hippocratic healers were to be rig rigorously ethical in how they lived, as well as how they practiced medicine. Abu Bakr al-Razi lived 865 to 925 in Persia, which is an area of Baghdad today. He contributed much to early medicine, especially neurology, but he was a pioneer in the treatment of mental illnesses. When he was the director of the main hospital in Baghdad, he established a special section for the treatment of those with mental health challenges. He treated his patients with respect, care, and empathy. As part of discharge planning, 
Each patient was given a sum of money to help with immediate needs. This was the first recorded reference to psychiatric aftercare. He championed the idea that all men were created equal and endowed with reason sufficient to manage their own lives. And this was a very novel idea in his time. This slide shows a picture of a pamphlet that was created for medical ethics by Thomas Percival in 1794. Thomas Percival lived in, from 1740 to 1804. He drew up a pamphlet with this code and wrote an expanded version in 1803 that was entitled Medical Ethics, or a Code of Institutes and Precepts Adapted to the Professional Conduct of Physicians and Surgeons, in which he coined the expression medical ethics. Percival encouraged medical professionals to work as a team and to priority, prioritize quality patient care above all other considerations. There are many other key figures in the history of medical ethics. St. Thomas Aquinas was an Italian who lived from 1225 to 1274 and touted that basic good respect, that the basic good is to respect others' dignity and help them live within community. Immanuel Kant lived 1724 to 1804 and spoke that every person in a similar circumstance deserves the same respect and treatment. People should not be treated as a means to an end. John Stuart Mill lived from 1806 to 1873. A famous quote of his is, actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. He was considered the first person that spoke of utilitarianism, which is an action is morally sound if it provides the greatest good to the most people. Victor Frankl lived from 1905 to 1997. He is most fa famous for his book, Man's Search for Meaning, which he wrote after his internment in a uh, Nazi prison camp. Um, he spoke that a sense of purpose leads to a conscious decision to do the right thing. And finally, Lawrence Kohlberg, lived from 1927 to 1987, and he's considered the father of moral psychology, which is the needs of the organization should be secondary to the needs of the patient. I think if you look at, through history, some of these things these ethical theorists say definitely apply to our work in peer support. The development of medical ethics in the United States began with the formation of the American Medical Association in 1847. Although it was specifically for phys physicians, this also was the foundation for ethics for many other disciplines. The Code of Medi Medical Ethics, shown on this slide of the American Medical Association, is rooted in an understanding of the goals of medicine as a profession, which dates back to the fifth century before Christ and the Greek physician Hippocrates to relieve suffering and promote well-being in a relationship of fidelity with the patient. As adopted by the young AMA in 1847, the code drew significantly on the work of the English physician philosopher Thomas Percival, whose 1803 Code of Medical Ethics set standards of conduct relative to hospitals and other charities. The AMA formed for unification and to standardize medical practice and education, to scrutinize new medical technologies and practices, and to promote medical ethics and quality patient care. In 1923, the code was revised to include preventive medicine and me keeping medical records. 
The Nuremberg Code was developed to establish standards for human research. It outlined 10 ethical and practical conditions by which scientific research on humans might be deemed permissible. I won't go through all 10 of these, but some of these are the voluntary consent of human subjects is absolutely essential and that the experiment should be conducted so as to avoid all unnecessary physical and mental suffering and injury. No experiment should be conducted where there is a reason to believe that death or disabling injury might occur. And the degree of risk to be taken should never exceed that determined by the humanitarian importance. Proper preparation should be made to protect the, the experimental subjects against even remote possibilities of injury, disability, or death. And the experiment should be brought to an end if the physical or mental state where continu continuation of the experiment seems to be impossible. Interestingly, in 1947, the Nuremberg Code was not officially accepted as law in any nation or as official ethics guidelines by any association. In fact, the code's reference to Hippocratic duty to the individual patient and the need to provide information was not even initially favored by the American Medical Association. The Western, Western world initially dismissed the Nuremberg Code as a code for barbarians and not for civilized physicians and investigators. Additionally, the final judgment did not specify whether the Nuremberg Code could be applied to cases such as political prisoners, convicted felons, and healthy volunteers. The lack of clarity, the brutality of the unethical medical experiments, and the uncompromising language of the Nuremberg Code created an image that the code was designed for singularly egregious transgression. But we have witnessed research here in the United States that did not follow this code. Examples are the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis, um, radiation experiments on human subjects, and the Willowbrook hepatitis study. In 1948, we had the Declaration of Geneva by the World Medical Association. And this says, the health and well being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not permit considerations of age, disease, or disability creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me, even after the patient has died. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity and in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. I will give to my teachers, colleagues, and students the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will share my medical knowledge for the benefit of the patient and advancement of healthcare. I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care to the highest standard. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties even under threat. And I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honor. I really like the Geneva Code because to me, it can be used for peer support. It aligns with our values so closely. In 1975, there was a follow-on declaration of Helsinki that applied and adopted Nuremberg for research. It 
So there are three basic ethical schools of thought. The first is consequential and is consequentialism where consequentialism is the consequences of one's conduct are the ultimate basis for any judgment about the rightness or wrongness of that conduct. Thus, from a consequentialist, consequentialist standpoint, a morally right act or a mission from acting is the one that will produce a good outcome or consequence. The moral worth of an action is determined by its potential consequence, not by whether it follows a set of written edicts or laws. One example would entail lying under the threat of government punishment to save an innocent person's life, even though it is illegal to lie under oath. A second ethical school of thought is deontology. It is an ethical theory that uses rules to distinguish right from wrong. Deontology is often associated with philosopher Immanuel Kant. Deontology is simple to apply. It just requires that people follow the rules and do their duty. Unlike consequentialism, which judges actions by their results, Deontology doesn't require weighing the costs and benefits of a situation. This avoids subjectivity and uncertainty because you only have to follow set rules. So following the rules makes deontology easy to apply, but it also means disregarding the possible consequences of our actions when determining what is right and what is wrong. The third basic ethical school of thought is virtue ethics. This character-based approach to morality assumes that we acquire virtue through practice. By practicing being honest, brave, just, generous, and so on, a person develops an honorable and moral character. According to Aristotle, by honing virtuous habits, people will likely make the right choice when faced with ethical challenges. To illustrate the difference among three, the three key moral philosophies, ethicists Mark White and Robert Arp refer to the film The Dark Knight, where Batman has the opportunity to kill the Joker. Consequentialism would endorse killing the Joker. By taking this one life, Batman could save multitudes. Deontologists, on the other hand, would reject the killing of Joker simply because the law says it's wrong to kill. But a virtue ethicist would highlight the character of the person who kills the Joker. Does Batman want to be the kind of person who takes his enemies' lives? No, in fact, in this case, he doesn't. It's unlikely that when following your values and ethics, you fall always into one of these three categories, but we tend to see taking the parts of all three of these and implying them, applying them to the specific situation. We're going to talk about six ethical principles and how they apply to peer support specialists. The first is non-maleficence or do no harm. Um, most commonly when we think of not doing harm, it's causing harm by negligence, which is failure to follow proper procedures, failure to monitor carefully or to record information thoroughly, breaching patient confidentiality, or failure to obtain proper informed consent. These problems often occur unintentionally, but they might result in harm to the person. Several factors can contribute to negligence and negatively affect a person's performance, including lack of sleep, unexpected interruptions, 
confusion about or ignorance of safety measures and standard practices or distract, distraction caused by personal problems. So I want you to take a moment here and just think of this, of do no harm. Can you think of situation you've been in, in peer support, where you've had to make a choice based on do no harm? The second principle is beneficence. Peer support specialists will always promote the well being of people we're supporting, understanding that people self define what well being is. We don't decide for people what well being is for them. We support them to make that decision for themselves. Peer support specialists also can demonstrate beneficence by displaying a calm and sympathetic demeanor, encouraging trust and open communication with those they support and colleagues, asking detailed and thoughtful questions, pursuing knowledge in their profession, and staying aware of resources. Take a moment now and think of when you have applied the principle of beneficence when you've been providing peer support. The principle of autonomy is rooted in the inherent rights of individuals as human beings to make decisions for themselves or concerning themselves. In medicine, patient autonomy is the medical ethical principle that involves patients or their surrogate in the decision-making process. It also justifies a requirement for informed consent before treatment begins. Peer support specialists will always respect the rights of people we're supporting to be self-governing within their social and cultural framework. In addition to being provided with informative materials, persons also need more detailed information concerning their treatment plan. The information should include the effect on their ability. The information should include the risks and benefits of the proposed treatment, the possibility of long-term effects, the possible consequences of refusing the treatment, and the financial costs of the treatment. Peer support specialists can support people in the decision-making process by being aware of emotional distress that may make it difficult to make a decision, a lack of understanding of the material that's presented, or even language barriers. Peer support specialists will always promote justice and fairness for all people they support. Some examples we may encounter is fair distribution of a limited supply. Time and resources can be stretched thin and acting justly ensures a fair distribution of these scarce resources. Respect for the rights of all, including colleagues and those that are seeking services even in circumstances in which those rights complicate the process of providing care. Respect for morally acceptable laws. We must act in accordance with state and federal laws, as well as institutional policy, to act properly within our scope of practice. Peer support specialists can act to reduce or eliminate frequent barriers to justice, such as the lack of time, the lack of attention, having inconsistent routine, limited resources, or miscommunication. Often when supporting someone, we bridge these barriers by giving the person the time they need, giving them our full attention, and being transparent about what resources are available and making sure communication is done in a way that they fully understand. 
I want you to take a moment and think about where you've used justice in your practice of peer support. I think we talk about confidentiality or respecting privacy a lot. Um, legally, we have the HIPAA laws and in groups, we have support agreements where we talk about, please take what you learn, but don't take out personal information about somebody else without permission. This can be one of the most challenging things for peer support specialists when they're working on a support team. Um, is it okay to share within the team? What do you put on a note? And here again is when being transparent about what your obligation is to share and never say to someone, anything you say to me is totally confidential. If in fact, they bring up something like suicidal thoughts and you're required by your organization to report that. In some ways, we can find places where people can talk about things where other reporting isn't required. And the final is fidelity, the obligation to be truthful by expressing the truth or refraining from deception. Being transparent about what our limitations may be and direct about what we can do is a way we practice fidelity. I'm now going to move on to ethical decision making. Peer support specialists often encounter situations that require complex decision making. Religious beliefs, life experience, education, and emotion are factors that can affect a person's decisions. For example, religious beliefs might dictate moral obligations and relationships with family and friends might bias a person's way of interacting with others. Educational background might determine how well equipped an individual is to navigate unexpected complications or crisis situations. It is vital for all peer supporters to identify the factors that affect how they make decisions and question beliefs and attitudes that might have a negative effect on their ability to make ethical choices. Although laws, organizational policies, and codes of conduct can provide a reliable ethical framework that is not based on individual attitudes, they often do not provide solutions for specific situations that you face. Therefore, it is helpful to be aware of philosophical tools that can guide these choices. An example of a legal obligation that's actually often misunderstood is mandated reporter law. In most states, the mandated reporter law says that a person must report if a caregiver has, if there's abuse by a caregiver or suspected abuse of a child, older adult or a person with disability. The mandated reporter law does not address someone's personal thoughts of, say, self-harm or suicide. Often that's governed by organizational policy. And it's important to make the difference, to, to know the difference, because policy is something that you work from within to keep your job and actually can be more easily changed than a law. When we talk about ethical decision, decision making, I'll summarize with these three things, both your individual and societal, societal values and morals, the organizational policy, and legal obligations. Broadly defined, 
Paternalism is an action performed with the intent of pr promoting another's good, but occurring against the other's will or without the other's consent. Medical paternalism is a set of attitudes and practices in medicine in which a physician determines that a patient's wishes or choices should not be honored. This is a quote by Tom Insel when he was at NIMH, that the paternalism of the traditional mental health system has been disempowering. I know I have experienced this myself. Um, I've been hospitalized many, many times for suicidal thoughts and that whole process was very disempowering and my choice and wishes were often disregarded. Take a moment and think where you see paternalism in the system where you work. In 1990, the Patient Self-Determination, the Self-Determination Act came about. It does not create new rights for patients, but reaffirms the common law right of self-determination as guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Under the Patient Self-Determination Act, healthcare agencies must ask you whether you have advanced directives and must provide you with educational materials about your rights under the law. They also specify the right of an individual to make their own decisions. That when working with someone who may be thought to be incapable of making sound decisions, medical professionals are often tempted to make decisions that they believe are in the patient's best interest. An example of this might be withholding information or providing only selected information. The Patient Self-Determination Act requires all healthcare agencies, hospitals, long-term care facilities, home health agencies that receive Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement to recognize the living will and power attorney for healthcare as advanced directives. In some states, they allow a person to create psychiatric advanced directives where you can specify where you'd like to receive treatment, what kind of treatments you would agree to and not agree to. And the importance of this is if it's determined that you're not able to make the decision, the law is they have to go back to what you wrote before when you were considered capable and honor that. We're now going to talk briefly about some ethical decision making, ethical decision making and ethical dilemmas we may face. As you now know, acting ethically is far more than just following a strict set of rules. I really like this quote, perhaps acting ethically ought to feel good, but unfortunately it often may not. One approach to ethical decision-making is this real-world approach with four steps. Step one is recognizing the problem or the dilemma. What exactly is the situation? Do I have a feeling, a gut feeling, or concern? How might others see it? What are potential issues involved? What is my intuitive thought about how to react? What are my potential biases? What additional information might be useful? So when you, once you've recognized the problem and everything involved in it, step two is to analyze the problem or dilemma. Asking yourself, what ethical principles apply? What are the re relevant ethical guidelines or standards? What laws apply? 
what organizational policies apply, what personal beliefs or morals apply, and what practice guidelines exist for my profession or agency related to this situation. Step three is to decide on the best course of action. Questions you may ask yourself are, what are the many alternative courses of action? What are the potential consequences for each, both benefits and risk? What ethical principles may be violated by each option? How would I explain each option in a post-mortem or in a courtroom or in an analysis of how I performed in that situation. What will I do and do I need to and how will I document my decision? The fourth step is to evaluate the outcome. We should never make a decision and then not go back and look, well, how did that work out? Whenever possible, explore the process and outcomes later with the people involved, especially the person you are supporting if your action affected them. Learn from feedback. Consider the idea of procedural justice, where someone may dislike an outcome, but still believe that the process was fair. Honestly and objectively identify what went well and what went poorly. Use supervision to explore other options for action and reconsider whether you make a reasonable choice. Keep these options in mind for future situations. Now often we think we're faced with making an ethical decision in the moment. So one reason we present sort of this approach to decision making is if we make this habit all the time, if we're down where time is of the ensis, we're still going through this, maybe much faster than if we had time to think it out. But the other thing I want to remind you of, if you have time to do a full analysis of the situation before you make this decision, please take the time. It's very rare that that decision has to be permitted be made just in the moment. Certain ethical dilemmas are inherent in our work. I'd like to call this essential tensions. We have risk versus safety. safety. So offering independence and choice while minimizing serious danger. This often comes up when someone is thought to be a risk to themselves or others, either of self-harm or suicide. Closeness versus distance. This doesn't refer to our current, if you're listening to this now, our current situation of social distancing, <laughs> or if in the future, if you're listening to this, this was during the time we had social distancing. But when I talk about closeness versus distance here, it's building a connection with boundaries. So we want to establish that connection and closeness, but we are transparent about what our limitations are. Another place these tensions come up is sensitivity versus coldness. We want to demonstrate empathy while avoiding burnout. We have to care for ourselves as well. A minefield is a location with the potential of tripping on an explosive device with potential disastrous consequences. An ethical minefield is a service related situation where there is a potential risk of an ethical violation. These are areas to tread carefully. The first I have listed here is coercion. Autonomy requires a degree of free choice. Some choices may result in potential harm on both sides. 
What constitutes coercion in contrast to incentives, persuasion, or encouragement? Can you think of ways in your, when you're doing peer support that you avoid coercion and also ways that you might be involved in coercion? Sometimes coercion can be very subtle, such as making the statement, I'd be so happy if you made the choice to do such and such. If that person really wants me to be happy, they may make the choice based on my happiness instead of what they think is best for them. That's a subtle form of coercion. Another one is informed consent. Fidelity involves helping people get what they want from services. Yet services require action from the person and do not guarantee a desired outcome. So, as I said previously, there's all the parts of informed consent. It has to include anything. It isn't just these are the best outcomes or these are what's expected, but also what are potentially bad outcomes. Confidentiality and maintaining personal privacy must be balanced against needs to share information as part of effective treatment. Considering society's right to be safe, funding requirements, and other factors. Who owns the right to privacy and confidentiality? For me, this is the minefield I come up against most often. And in peer support, we treat treat our relationships with people above everything else and privacy comes into everything we do and this is a place to have really open and frank discussions both with your supervisor to find out what the organizational policy is and then with the person you're supporting so that you're not unintentionally breaking what they thought was ultimate confidentiality and the final is culture. Do we treat people equally with justice or specially based on their identity, history, and background? Often this comes from knowing ourselves. What biases are we bringing into a relationship? Um, I've often said, I strive to be non-judgmental. I'd love to be non-judgmental. But the fact is, I am judgmental. I'm judging myself and I'm judging others all the time. But can I be open and, and approach that connection with genuine curiosity so that my judgment, I can recognize it as something based on my experience and I can be curious about someone else's experience and not closed off to what they have to say. To end today, I'm just going to go way back to the beginning and look at our objectives just for a quick review. So we talked about key events in medical history, we, in the history of medical ethics, which for me, you know, it started with Hippocrates, but then the, the Geneva Code and the Helsinki Code um, really foundationally support what I believe we should be doing in peer support. The ethical schools of thought, consensualism, deontology, and value ethics all bring different perspectives in. And we have to take in all those perspectives when we are making an ethical decision. We talked about the six, six ethical principles and we briefly talked about ethical decision making and how to make that an intentional process and not just something you do in the moment based on a gut feeling. And we talked at the end about some potential ethical minefields in peer support. I want to thank you all for attending today. Again, this webinar will be recorded and on our website. Thank you to the National Association of Peer Supporters. Our website is www.inaops.org. It's also www.peersupportworks.org. 
and we're moving toward that. PeerSupportWorks.org. Again, if you would like to receive a certificate for attendance at this webinar, email membership at inaops.org and ask for the quiz. I will send you a quiz and then once you complete the quiz, you will receive a certificate. I want to thank you all for listening today and have a nice day.